Resonance is one of the most fundamental phenomena in our universe. Almost everything resonates because the natural tendency when there's a force is to balance the system at the point of equilibrium. This system can be a string, a pendulum, or I don't know, even a building and this wine glass. Here I built a simple microphone circuit to enhance the signals from this electric microphone so that we can see the sound waves on the oscilloscope screen. You will now witness the resonance phenomena by your own eyes. So I just hooked up my tiny oscilloscope across the microphone and I have to capture the screen manually when I get the transient response. It took several tries to get a satisfactory response since how you hit and the position of the microphone all of them affecting the waveform. If I can carefully hit the glass and press hold at the same time and good response but still harmonics appears. Let me try once again and there it is. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. This is a typical, beautiful and elegant real illustration of an underdamped system that can be even put into a science book as an ideal example for an underdamped system. As you see here, the wine glass starts oscillating and tends to keep oscillate, but immediately it is damped by the quantum forces between the glass molecules probably, and the equilibrium had been reached eventually. We can also find the frequency of the ringing of the wine glass since each square here is 20 milliseconds and as you can see, each square has only two peaks. That means our period between these two peaks is 20 milliseconds. The frequency is around 50 hertz. And this gives us a beautifully looking exponential decay. Exponential and oscillatory responses are everywhere in nature. You can find them together in any physical system. One of those physical systems is electronic circuits where we make use of oscillations for our own good. Here's a capacitor and inductor directly connected to each other. Imagine a hypothetical charge accumulation on the plates of the capacitor that will build voltage across the capacitor. That voltage will force those charges through the inductor and when the current passes through the inductor it will build its own magnetic field but then the magnetic field will collapse because when the voltage on the capacitor becomes zero but the induced EMF will force the voltage across the inductor be reverted and force currents to keep flowing towards the capacitor to charge it in the reverse order. When it is fully charged in the reverse order, it will dump the same current but in the opposite direction towards the inductor again and building a magnetic field and that magnetic field around the inductor when it collapses will force the current to move towards the capacitor once again and this cycle will go on and go on till infinity and we get free energy. But sadly, there is no infinite energy. At least, we don't have eternal lives to prove that. Part of the energy stored in the magnetism and electricity will radiate as an electromagnetic radiation during the collapse of magnetic field and the voltage. And another part of it will be converted into heat. If there's heat, that means a resistance. So we have to correct this picture in this way. So there is always a resistance, even if you connect a capacitor and an inductor directly together, they will always have a series equivalent resistance or equivalent series resistance and it is called ESR. Therefore, you will never have an LC circuit, but instead you will always have an RLC circuit. But if you connect the elements directly together, you can call this circuit as parallel LC circuit, but normally it will act as a series RLC circuit, but since the R is extremely small, the damping constant will also be small so that it will appear as a parallel LC circuit. We can also find the natural resonance frequency of this system by simply knowing that at the resonance that means when there is an oscillation, the system tends to keep that oscillation with the highest possible power. That means the maximum power transfer must happen between two impedances. Either you can choose C and R or R and L. Let me choose C and R and try to figure out this system's resonance frequency by the easiest way. So impedance of this combination will be minus J 1 over omega C plus R. The impedance of this side will be J omega L 
since the conjugates must equal, I will take either the conjugate of this side or that side and equate to each other for the maximum power transfer. And the imaginary parts of these conjugates must be equal at the same time. That means J over omega C will be equal to J omega L. And J's cancel. Taking the omega to the other side, we'll get omega square will be equal to 1 over LC. And as a result, our natural frequency will be 1 over square root of LC. So this is my natural resonance frequency. You can also say F0 will be equal to 1 over 2 pi root of LC. Indeed, we have a negative counterpart of this frequency, but we are now interested in the positive one because we are only interested in the absolute value. Now let's look at what will be the current in this system when it is excited. If we take the KVL around the loop, we get a differential equation looking like square i dt squared plus r over l di dt plus 1 over lc i be equal to zero. Because we imagine that we charge the capacitor and let the system run for about some time actually. As a result, we don't have any forcing function or a constant on the other side of the differential equation. So the solution of this differential equation came out to be a typical I of t equals c1 e to r1t plus c2 e to r2t. This current oscillates or sometimes doesn't oscillate. It's gonna oscillate or not will be determined by these two coefficients, r1 and r2. r1 and r2 depends on the natural frequency and the damping constant. Square is 1, r2 equals omega 0, the root of square minus 1. Here, taking the parentheses, minus the damping constant and minus times, and that will be plus, like that. So these expressions will have some exponential decay, and at the same time, if this is complex, they will have some oscillations at the same time. In order to make this negative, as you can see, the damping constant squared minus 1 must be smaller than 0. And from that, damping constant squared must be smaller than 1. So as we just said, there are three cases here. Either this expression can be positive, 0 or negative. The one we are interested in is this expression being negative. Because in that case, we will have a complex number here and we will have a complex number here and here that will cause some oscillations along with an exponential decay. And this kind of response is called underdamped response. And for that, as you can see, since damping constant can't be negative number, so we will need that damping constant must be smaller than one to satisfy underdamped case. So we also consider this circuit as a series RLC circuit because of the ESR of our capacitor and inductor. So for the series RLC network, the damping constant is calculated to be as R over 2, this R is ESR, the square root of the capacitance over the inductance. So this is the damping constant. And as you can see, by adjusting our inductor and capacitor, we can decide whether this circuit will ring or not. So I have a 470 microhenry inductor. If I use a capacitor like 1 nanofarad, a tiny capacitor that will guarantee that the damping constant will indeed smaller than 1. So here I set up the parallel LC network. This is our 470 microhenry inductor and there is a ceramic capacitor which is 1 nanofarad. Let's try to charge the ceramic capacitor with 9 volt battery. Okay, and this is our switch and now when I touch the positive probe of the oscilloscope will actually close the loop and if we can get... Oh, you see? Something happens but nothing. Well, let me charge it again. Just this silly peak. Okay, let us try the same thing with another capacitor. This capacitor is an electrolytic 1 microfarad capacitor, but we have to be careful about its polarity. Yes. Let's give it a shot. Charging it. Since the ringing frequency is W0 times square root of 1 minus the square of the damping constant, and in that case, it is almost equal to the natural frequency. And when we calculate, it happens to be around 7.3 kilohertz that our oscilloscope is capable of screening, but impossible to catch manually. 
Resistance of our jumper cables are also around 1.2 ohms. This expression here is around 0.6. That means our damping constant would be 0.6 times square root of C over L. And therefore, as long as the values that keeps damping constant smaller than one, around 0.6.7 or 0.2.3 would do. When we choose our capacitor, our damping constant is extremely small. That makes our ringing frequency way too high, around 7.3 kilohertz. Thus, it seems that even if our capacitor value is as high as 100 microfarads or 220 microfarads or even 1000 microfarads, it will be underdamped because of the 0.6 and our large inductance. As a result, we can try three different values for the capacitance, the 100 microfarads and 220 microfarads and 1000 microfarads, in other words, one millifarad. Let me replace the capacitor with 100 microfarads as we talked early. And now we expect around 700 Hertz of ringing frequency. That means we can see the waveform around two milliseconds of squares here so the oscilloscope is adjusted to 20 millivolts so we must see some ringing let's try that out i'm charging the capacitor now and when i touch it <laughs> did you see it again <laughs> and now we can replace with 220 microfarads so we expect that the period will be larger and charging the capacitor now dumping whoa Whoa, <laughs> you see it? Much clearer now. Let's try now the 1000 microfarads. Charging, okay, and holding. Whoa, whoa, and second one, whoa. So it rings violently. In order to ring continuously, the stimulations must be continuous and even be at the right time so that minimum energy can ignite a pure continuous oscillation. This circuit simply makes use of parallel LC circuits ringing into a constant oscillatory response by a repetitive switching at high frequency. Somebody has built a mini version of this circuit with an LED instead of diode. It can even be run with a single 9 volt battery and the plasma is even observable at the tip of the secondary. The parasitic air capacitance with a gigantic electric field can affect the devices near it. At the time of Nikola Tesla, vacuum tubes were used, but today we can build these circuits easily thanks to semiconductor technology. Once the capacitor is charged, it turns on the transistor and current through the primary inductor builds a magnetic field, which induces a current on the secondary winding such that the magnetic field on the secondary would oppose the build of the current. That current then through the diode, reverse biases the BJT transistor which turns off and forces primary winding to collapse the magnetic field. That collapse induces a high voltage on the primary and because of the turn ratio, a super high voltage is thus switch polarity on the secondary for a very short time interval. That again turns on the transistor at a rate that is determined nothing but the LC resonance frequency of the capacitor of the BJT and the circuit, primary and secondary inductors, and even it is not seen here but the parasitic capacitance of air. A magnificent example to a simple Slayer exciter circuit is this circuit that I'm holding. Even if it has a couple of thousands of volts, I can hold it with my bare hand like this and nothing happens. How do you think that nothing happens with... Even if it looks harmless, the Slayer Exciter circuit creates high voltage super hot plasma that can pinch you off badly and then you scared and overreact like me. But typical fun stuff that you can experiment is... Well, there is something that wants to get out of the box. There it is, you can light up fluorescent bulbs like that without touching anything. This coil has a special name, it is Tesla coil. Once Nikola Tesla himself was experimenting different things with huge versions of it, like wireless electricity. It is not an easy task to get an aesthetic looking underdamped response like the one when we ring the wine glass because our parallel LC network is more sensitive and can be easily affected by anything during the ringing. It is a level of sensitivity that is beyond what my hands can do during switching. 
Even a slightest twitch in my hand causes massive distortion in the waveform. Also, as we see, even if damping constant is smaller than 1, microscopic damping constants do not work and cause vibrations to collapse, but if the damping constant is kept higher but smaller than 1 by increasing both capacitor and inductor, which will in turn lower the oscillation frequency at the same time, a less sensitive and therefore a uniform underdamped response can be obtained. Contrary to common belief, Nothing actually vibrates in nature. Everything tends to be less energetic and more likely to be a stable state. The systems like Tesla coils are great examples. They constantly resonate to vibrate because there is always a constant field of potential energy. When the potential goes away, the oscillations simply collapse.